Thanks very much. Um, would like to begin with an announcement on behalf of the organizers. Um, it is usually um, the case that on, on the first day of the week with uh, many new arrivals, there's an organizational meeting at 11 o'clock. Today, since there was no coffee at 11 o'clock, we'll have this meeting at 2 p.m. in the afternoon in the founders room. So all new arrivals in the Black Hole program, we'll see you there. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the charge I got from the director was to explain to the attendees of the LHC program uh, what the Black Hole program is all about. Um, explain to them what are the interesting problems that we are contemplating and why is our gathering uh, timely. So with that in mind, I will tell you the truth, nothing but the truth, but not the whole truth. <laughs> I, I will opt for breadth and I will give you some history and some background. And my primary aim, as the director charged me, is to tell you what are the questions we're contemplating and sketch out pathways towards the answers. We don't have any answers yet, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Um, if there is time at the end, I may um, take a little excursion and highlight uh, some, one of the neat physical systems that we encounter in our work, um, binary supermassive black holes and their paths towards mergers and the interesting physical effects that ensue. But uh, I have no good feeling of how long it's going to take me to go through my material, so that that last part may not make it. So in a nutshell, we're interested in understanding how the galaxies that we observe today got to be this way, and the role that their central supermassive black holes have played in shaping them. So that is the theme. And I will start by putting you all in the right mood by giving you some relevant large numbers so that you can understand um, the dynamic range of masses, luminosities, <coughs> etc., that we are dealing with. We often scale uh, the quantities that we measure uh, to the sun. So let's start with the sun. Okay. So the mass of the sun is 2 times 10 to the 33 grams. And the luminosity is 4 times 10 to the 33 ergs per second. Okay. So these are not particularly uh, meaningful just yet. I have to tell you more about the systems that are of immediate interest. Uh, the mass of the Milky Way, okay. in fact, I should promptly erase these numbers so I can leave up the numbers that I want you to refer to. The Milky Way, it has a mass which is about 10 to the 12, the mass of the sun. Okay. And a luminosity that is about 2 times 10 to the 10, the luminosity of the sun. Okay. Its diameter is about 30 kiloparsecs. And for easy reference and comparison to other numbers, 10 to the 5 light years. Okay. Now, the Milky Way is not a particularly large galaxy. It's a run-of-the-mill kind of galaxy. Um, we will encounter much bigger galaxies, giant ellipticals. M87 is one of them. It's in the center of the Virgo cluster. It has a luminosity which is about 30 times that of the Milky Way. It has a diameter that is about twice that of the Milky Way. Now, its mass is an interesting question. Um, according to the reference material that I consulted, the mass is about twice that of the Milky Way within the visible radius of the galaxy. But there's a lot of invisible stuff outside the, uh, the visible radius, uh, stuff that we call dark matter and whose origin and nature are not very well understood. It could be then up to 200 times the mass of the Milky Way. So that is indeed a giant galaxy, and we will encounter lots of these when we encounter lots of these. Okay. Now, you will often hear me 
uh, talk about black holes, of course, the black holes that you that we uh, concern ourselves ourselves with range from 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 9 times the mass of the sun. They can get even bigger. But here's a run-of-the-mill example. A typical <coughs> supermassive black hole has a mass in the middle of that range, 10 to the 8, sorry, times the mass of the sun. Okay. The radius of its horizon is about two astronomical units. And for comparison with other numbers, 16 light minutes. Okay? You should contrast this with the size of a galaxy. And I hope that you will be shocked when I tell you in a moment that from a region about this size, we get luminosities that are two to three orders of magnitude larger than the luminosity of the galaxy. Okay? Now, at this mass, the black hole can control the dynamics of the stars in its immediate vicinity, and, it, and the potential of the black hole dominates over the collective potential of the stars at distances that are about um, 10 to the 6 um, horizon radii, which is 11 parsecs for the astronomers, 35 <coughs> light years for easy comparison with other numbers. OK. What was this RH? OK. So let me begin with some history. At the turn of the 20th century, in 1909, Edward Fath completed his PhD thesis at Lick Observatory. And in his, as part of his thesis, he took spectra of nearby galaxies. Um, he, was, he had an agenda, but what he found, just to cut to the chase, what he found was that the spectra of most galactic nuclei, um, consisted of a continuum with absorption lines, very similar to the spectra of old stars. And from that, he concluded that the stellar content of galactic nuclei is mostly stars. In a small fraction of the galaxies that he, ob he observed, uh, he found that the spectra consisted of very strong emission lines that were characteristic of uh, photoionized nebulae that we see in the Milky Way. Okay. So this trend, this pattern, was noted also by Hubble in the 1920s when he was studying galaxies and taking spectra. He noted that a substantial fraction of galaxies, sorry, a fraction of galaxies show emission lines in their nuclei. And then a more systematic study of uh, the emission line galaxies was undertaken by Seifert in the 40s. Today we call those galaxies Seifert galaxies. So Hubble and Seifert worked at Palomar Observatory. Fast forward to the 30s, Jansky discovers the first radio emission from galaxies. Okay. His work was not taken seriously until it was confirmed by others, mostly after World War II. Okay. In the 50s, a systematic effort to identify the counterparts of the radio sources was undertaken, again, at Caltech by Bade and Minkowski. They identified objects that we call today radio galaxies. These are galaxies that coincide with the radio sources discovered by radio observatories. And they noted that these are galaxies with emission lines in their nuclear spectra. So the Seifert galaxies identified earlier uh, were more or less shown to be of the same ilk as the radio sources. Okay. So radio sources were then found in the hundreds by the end of the decade. In the late 50s, the 3C radio survey was published. Um, and in, by the 70s and early 80s, X-ray emission was discovered from space-based observatories, using space-based observatories from um, these types of galaxies. So the picture today, as we see it today, is that 10% of all galaxies are active in this sense. And nuclear activity means we observe phenomena, including emission lines, nebular emission lines, strong X-ray emission, and strong radio emission <coughs> from the nuclei of galaxies, from a very compact region. There is no way we can explain these um, properties by invoking stellar processes. Therefore, we think something else is going on. And that's why we call these galaxies active. One particularly interesting observation is that the radio emission often comes from very large sources, 
large lobes of uh, plasma that is, seems to be ejected from the very center by large radio jets. Okay, and the jets uh, move on close to the speed of light. Okay, so I will use, just to get my terminology straight, I will use the word active galactic nucleus very often. And the abbreviation is AGN. Okay, but active galaxy is an equivalent term, and quasar is an equivalent term. You can ask me at the end if you want to know where this comes from. QSO is almost equivalent. Okay, so I, these terms are often used interchangeably. For practical purposes, the difference is that quasars are extremely luminous compared to active galactic nuclei. So they emit a lot more power, maybe three orders of magnitude higher power or more. Okay. All right. So before I get into the properties, um, actually, let me tell you about the properties of active galaxies as we see them today and what they imply. Okay. So we see emission of high energy photons. Okay. The energies goes into, go into the X-ray regime. Tens of keV is uh, garden variety. We see uh, photon energies up to MeV and even GeV. Um, we also see rapid variability. Okay, we see that the X-ray flux can double in on time scales of hours and maybe even minutes. The combination of these two observations suggests that the source is very compact. The light travel time across the source has to match the variability time scale. And uh, we're led to think then that the uh, power source is associated with a very deep potential well. Okay. We also observe very high luminosities. Okay. More than 10 to the 46 ergs per second. That's 10 to the 13 times the, the luminosity of the sun. And this suggests that the whatever the power source is, it has to be very efficient in converting um, <coughs> gravitational potential energy in this case, or rest mass into energy. Okay. So these are two of the main arguments that lead us to consider black holes, supermassive black holes, as the power sources of active galaxies. Um, and they're corroborated by a number of more indirect arguments. We observe widths of the emission lines that are extremely large, thousands to tens of thousands of kilometers per second. Those represent bulk motion of the gas, and they support the idea that we're in a very deep potential well. Uh, we also observe very fast collimated outflows, very close to the speed of light. And empirically, from our experience studying outflows from, from stars, we can associate the terminal speed of the outflow with the escape speed from the compact object. And that also suggests that the compact object uh, is likely to be a black hole. Okay. So with this in mind, uh, We've developed a model for the central, what we call the central engine, the ultimate power source in the center of the galaxy. Um, the power is derived from the potential energy of a lot of gas falling into the very deep potential well of a supermassive black hole. The supermassive black holes have masses in the range 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 9 solar masses. The rate at which we're feeding gas, the rate at which gas is fed into them, can be 1 or 2 solar masses per year in the most extreme cases, or a fraction of a solar mass per year in less extreme cases. And just to illustrate that, uh, we can ask the question, how much energy can we derive from a photon, for, sorry, from a proton that's brought from a very large distance into uh, the a marginally stable orbit very close to the black hole? Okay, so let's say that we consider a non-rotating black hole. Okay. The radius of the innermost stable orbit is six in units of the mass. Uh, the energy per proton you would get 
in MeV, if you bring it from infinity down to that radius, would be 53, and that's 5.7% of the rest mass. You can then go to a maximally rotating black hole and do the same exercise. You move the innermost stable orbit a lot closer in. You get a lot more energy out of the process, and that is almost half of the rest mass. So you can harness a lot of energy uh, through this process. Now, to reinforce the argument I made earlier that you cannot produce this kind of energy from a regular stellar process, let me compare this to the nuclear reaction chain, the proton-proton chain that's responsible for producing power in the sun. This will give us 7.1 MeV per nucleon, which is a lot less than any of the above. This is 0.76% of the rest mass. Okay? So in order to reproduce the observed uh, power, we do need extremely high efficiency of converting rest mass into energy, and that's one of the arguments that leads us to favor black holes as the, as the power sources. Okay. Now, suppose that we manage to uh, harness the available energy, which is not a foregone conclusion. How much radiative power can we get? We can write the luminosity that comes out uh, in the form of electromagnetic radiation in this fashion. That's the luminosity. This is the rate at which, we're, uh, at which gas is uh, thrown towards the black hole. This is an efficiency factor, which we can get from here. Okay? And not knowing uh, what exact number to pick, we pick something in the middle of that range, and we call it 10%. And this will come, uh, become an interesting question in a moment. So if we plug in numbers, we get, um, sorry, we can convert this into an accretion rate, and that gives us 0.2 solar masses per year, assuming that eta is 0.1, and assuming that we observe a luminosity of 10 to the 45 Earth per second. And you will see me scaling numbers like this. Uh, this is a very standard way of presenting the scales. So we need a substantial reservoir of fuel to keep quasars going. Argument, various arguments for the lifetimes of active galaxies put them to about 0.8, sorry, 10 to the 8 uh, years. So we have to have a large supply of gas to keep the process going for 10 to the 8 years. Okay? So 10 to the 8 solar masses is the mass of a giant molecular cloud. So the whole thing has to go in uh, to sustain the luminosity. The flow? Um, here it is. And that is not a good assumption. I will make it nonetheless, because it makes a good heuristic presentation. But then I'll come to question it at, at later stages. And I'll show you in some of the detailed models, more, sorry, one of the more elaborate models that I'll present will show you that um, the emission is not isotropic and the flow is not isotropic either. Okay. So um, with that cue, let's co let me continue with this uh, poorly justified assumption of isotropic flow. I want to introduce one more concept that is extremely uh, relevant to everything else that I have to say. And that is the Eddington limit. So the picture is that the flow is isotropic. The black hole is here. Stuff comes in from every direction. Produces photons somewhere. The photons try to escape, and they have to fight against the inflow. If we turn up the accretion rate, the back reaction from the radiation increases. And we can reach some kind of balance where the pressure from the inflowing gas is balanced by the radiation pressure of the photons going out. That's the Eddington limit. Okay. So let's say that we've achieved that balance. And we uh, manage to equate the, out, the outward radi radiation pressure with the inward gas pressure. We get a limiting luminosity, the Eddington luminosity, 
which you can write as this formula. Okay, this is the Thomson cross section. There's a number of fundamental constants in the mass of the black hole. And the, the built in assumption is that the interaction of the outgoing photons with the inflowing matter is via Compton scatter. That is an inefficient process. The, Compton, the Thomson cross section is pretty small compared to uh, cross sections for interactions in bound bound transitions or bound free transitions. Those can be many orders of magnitude higher. But this is a heuristic uh, limit, and you'll see that it's very useful. Okay, so if I plug in numbers, I get 1.3 times 10 to the 46 ergs per second, assuming a 10 to the 8 solar mass black hole. So you can think of this as a limiting luminosity for a massive black hole. Once the luminosity exceed this, exceeds this limit, a lot of things uh, start to change. Okay, for example, the excess matter can be expelled. Um, with this in mind, then, you can go and write a limiting accretion rate. of about two solar masses per year. So this is the accretion rate that gives you the Eddington luminosity for the 10 to the 8 solar mass black hole. Okay. So with these ideas in mind, here's a more physically motivated and more detailed scenario for how the black hole is fed. Okay. So we think that uh, the flow makes an accretion disk an equatorial disk when it gets very close to the black hole. And that is motivated, that um, scenario is motivated by appealing to other systems, binary stars, where we have much more direct observational evidence that the flow from one star onto the other forms a disk. Another motivation for invoking a disk is that it's a very effective uh, mechanism for extracting the angular momentum of the gas. In order for the gas to settle in, if it's not coming perfectly in perfectly radial orbits, it has to shed its angular momentum. And the accretion disk is a mechanism for producing torques to do this. So very quickly, the picture is like this. There's the hole. The disk would be something around it. If I can draw it, well, it has radial extend, here we go. Okay, so this is my cutout drawing of the disk. The idea here is that in different annually in the disk, the uh, rotation is Keplerian. So the, uh, the tangential velocity drops with the radius. Therefore, two adjacent annually would be moving at different speeds the differential rotation plus a magic viscosity mechanism, which we are only now beginning to understand, leads to a torque which allows angular momentum to be transported outwards. So a small amount of mass is moving outwards at the edge of the disk, carrying away a lot of angular momentum, and it is allowing most of the mass to flow inwards. Okay, That's accomplished by these torques, which rely on the differential rotation plus viscosity, and I'll put this in quotes because it's not really a viscosity. Okay, so the viscosity model uh, is parametric. <coughs> Essentially, when it was invented, the, uh, it was intended to bypass all the microphysics that were not well understood. <coughs> and the idea um, that was probably in the back of the minds of the inventors, Shakura and Sanyaev, was that there is some kind of turbulent mechanism. So the viscosity parameter depended on the pressure, depended on the scale height of the disk, because that limits the size of turbulent currents that can circulate inside the disk. Uh, and it also depended on the speed of sound. And that gives you the right scaling and the right dimensions. Okay. Um, I can tell you a little bit about other disk properties. The radial drift rate 
is very small. Okay. So the radial speed is 10 to the minus 5 smaller than the azimuthal speed. The azimuthal speed is more or less the Keplerian speed. Okay. The disk radiates locally. All the energy that is dissipated by the torques, by the differential rotation, is assumed to be radiated locally. And that gives you a temperature profile that goes as r to the minus 3 quarters. And it's further assumed that the radiation escapes with a black body spectrum. So the flux as a function of radius from the disk is r to the minus 3. Okay. So if you write down the scalings, you find that the innermost temperature is of order 10 to the 5 degrees. Therefore, the radiation spectrum that we observe from an object like this is in the ultraviolet to far ultraviolet part of the spectrum, and that matches the observations of active galactic nuclei pretty well. And these types of successes led to confidence that this model is on the right track. Okay. Now, we can distinguish. Yep. It, flow, it flows very gradually. So the flow is, is very, very slow, but it, it's finite. And, that's, and, and so it takes a quite a long time for the potential energy to be extracted. So you can associate a, once you write down the viscosity law, you can associate a time scale with that. And that time scale can be pretty long. So for the inner parts of a disk around a supermassive black hole, that time scale can be 10 to the 6 years. Okay, so it's a, it's a long-term process. Um, so, when the model was developed by Shakura and Sanyev, they, di they distinguished uh, more or less three zones. So, I'll try to make three zones here. Okay. I'll call this the radiation zone. I'll call this the gas pressure zone. And then I won't put a name on the outer zone. In the inner parts, the temperature is extremely high. Radiation pressure is extremely high. Therefore, the disk is supported in the vertical direction by radiation pressure. Okay. As you go further out, the temperature drops. Gas pressure becomes dominant over radiation pressure. And then as you go even further out, then you get to uh, a zone where the gas is unstable to fragmentation. So the local self-gravity of the gas causes uh, the outer annually to contract. The contraction wins over the internal gas pressure. So you get fragmentation and possibly formation of stars. So this is what limits the size of the disk in the outer parts. Okay. The extent of these zones depends very much on the accretion rate and on the mass of the black hole. So it doesn't make sense to write um, any numbers. But the interesting consequence of, of this zone, if radiation pressure is important in the inner parts of the disk, then we have the possibility of pushing gas out by radiation pressure and generating outflows. And the generation of outflows is one of the main themes in the second half of what I have to say. Okay. There are possibilities for this disk to become very thick near the center. It can puff up if you can find a way to increase the internal pressure. And that can happen in two extremes. In the extreme of very high accretion rate, the temperature gets extremely high, radiation pressure in the disk shoots up, and it provides support to keep the disk very thick. In the opposite extreme, the density of, of low accretion rate, the density drops. The cooling is inefficient, so gas pressure can puff up the disk. So we have the possibility of making disks that look like donuts, which then get thin on the way out. Okay. So finally, before uh, I finish this historical introduction, uh, I have to mention the, the fueling problem. Um, the fueling problem really is uh, a problem of getting rid of angular momentum. The gas that will ultimately get into the black hole and produce the power that we observe lives in the host galaxy. It has to travel 
down to the center, and it has to shed somehow its angular momentum. So from the host galaxy to get to the vicinity of the black hole, uh, the angular momentum per unit mass has to go down by a factor of 10 to the 3. So then from the vicinity of the black hole to go into the black hole, the angular momentum per unit mass has to go down by another two orders of magnitude. So therein lies the fueling problem. How can the angular momentum be extracted and allow flow towards the center of the galaxy? Let's start backwards. The accretion disk is supposed to accomplish this part. Once the disk is established and it functions the way I just described, then it can do the job. The missing ingredient is the source of the torques. And the source of the torques, as we understand it today, is hydromagnetic, sorry, magnetohydrodynamic turbulence that causes high specific angular momentum material to propagate outwards in the disk allowing uh, most of the material to flow in and accrete. This part is more difficult. We think that uh, during galaxy interactions, the large-scale tidal torques that act on the gas in the host galaxy can extract angular momentum efficiently and allow that gas to flow towards the center. That's demonstrated in numerical simulations, so we have some confidence that it might be a promising mechanism. However, when we do observations, we look for the signs of interaction in active galaxies. And the results that we get are ambiguous. We see interactions in some cases. So the galaxies involved in the interactions are active. But the picture as seen from observations gets to be very confusing after that. We see active galaxies that are not interacting with anything. So that raises the question of how did the flow from the host galaxy down to the center got accomplished. We also see interacting galaxies that are not active. So the jury is still out on how that process works. Okay. So this was the picture around uh, the turn of the millennium, until the 90s. We appreciated um, that supermassive black holes existed in galaxies that were not active, and we suspected that they were common, but we didn't know it for sure. Um, we also knew that uh, nuclear activity of this type and vigorous star formation were related to each other. They would coincide in the same galaxies. Okay. And the idea was that interactions between galaxies provided the torques to cause the flow from the host galaxy close to the center. Okay. Beyond that, it was thought that <coughs> the existence of an active nucleus and the black holes themselves were passive spectators in the bigger play of the evolution of galaxies. Interactions between galaxies um, were understood to be a major agent in galaxy evolution, but during those interactions, the triggering of nuclear activity, the feeding of the black hole, was somewhat of a unintended, well, somewhat of a sideshow, if you will. <coughs> But sometime in the 90s, um, our views drastically changed. We gained a new appreciation of the role that the black hole plays in shaping the evolution of its host galaxy. Um, and this was brought about by a number of discoveries. And here are two of the more influential ones. The late 80s and early, early 90s, it, was, it became possible to measure reliably the masses of black holes in galaxies using the orbits, by observing the orbits of the stars in their immediate vicinity. So we were able to develop uh, a database. In those days, it was a couple of dozen galaxies for which a reliable black hole mass was measured. Okay. And the first ideas were that the luminosity of the host galaxy which is a proxy of its mass, of the mass of the stars, was related to the mass of the black hole. After that, um, 
more careful uh, considerations led to the, what we call today the M-sigma relation. The mass of the black hole is proportional to the stellar velocity dispersion, to some power of the stellar velocity dispersion. Okay. The stellar velocity dispersion is a, is a proxy of the potential in which the stars move. And that indicates the mass of the stars and the mass of any unseen stuff like dark matter. Okay. So you can write it down more precisely. Approximately equal to 8.1, I think. Okay. So if the bulge of the host galaxy has a stellar velocity dispersion of 200 kilometers per second, the implied mass is at 10, of the black hole is 10 to the 8 solar masses. <coughs> now, this was a little shocking because uh, it suggests that the black hole, which is a very small object that doesn't do much, that was then a passive spectator, knows about the properties of the host galaxy. And the only way to understand how this works is by postulating that the host galaxy and the black hole co-evolve. So they build up their mass together through some process that is my next topic. Okay? So this implies co-evolution. Okay. The other idea was feedback. Okay? This is an F word that's in vogue quite a bit these days. Um, in, in the most general terms, feedback is really the injection of energy and momentum into the gas of the host galaxy by some process that's related or triggered by the contraction of that gas. So you let the gas flow towards the center. It does something that causes it to be energized. So you get negative feedback that inhibits the flow in a, in a broad sense. Okay. So feedback was invoked because there was a need to suppress star formation. Okay. So the motivation came from observations of massive elliptical galaxies, which stopped forming stars a long time ago. And according to other indicators, they should have continued to have a lot of gas and form stars today. So some process had to be found that evacuated the gas and stopped star formation a long time ago, at redshift maybe two or three, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, at the same time, we, uh, our community also appreciated the role of stellar feedback. Supernova explosions from the, formations of star, from the formation of stars pumps a lot of kinetic energy into the gas out of which the stars are forming, and that causes the gas to be evacuated and star formation stops. So it's a self-limiting process in a sense. We also knew that active nuclei uh, we're powering um, very um, strong outflows. And we knew that from observational indicators. So the ideas were put together to come up uh, with, with the feedback uh, scenarios. Okay? So that generated a new wave of interest and more reasons to understand the physics of accretion. And this is why we're here. So the goals of the conference now that I've hopefully set the stage, uh, as described by the organizers, are threefold. One big question is how do supermassive black holes get to be as massive as they are today? We observe them to have masses up to 10 to the 9 solar masses easily, perhaps up to 10 to the 10 solar masses. How did the growth process uh, work? And that's an interesting question in the context of the M sigma relation that suggests coevolution between the stars and the black hole. Another question is to understand the mechanisms that bring about feedback and the role that feedback plays in the evolution of the host galaxy. And this is where the black holes stop being passive spectators and they become active participants because they are the source of feedback. And then one of the, uh, one of the last uh, um, but not least topics of this conference is to think about black hole mergers which are a very interesting phenomenon and has connections to fundamental physics, the generation of gravitational waves, future generations of gravitational wave detectors, etc. If there is time, I'll get into that. If not, I'll outsource it to the next speaker. 
So let me set the stage. I'm going to leave this picture up. So let me st set the stage <coughs> for explaining the feeding pro uh, sorry, the growth problem. So how much time do I have left? OK. Um, OK. So suppose that the black hole forms as a small object, maybe with a mass of 10, 100 solar masses at the time that the galaxy forms. Then it grows in mass by swallowing gas. The maximum rate at which it can swallow gas is set by the Eddington limit. So as the black hole grows, its ability to uh, grow increases. So that is an exponential growth in the mass of the black hole. And you can write down its mass as a function of time. That's the initial mass times an exponential factor. And that time constant tau is what we call the saltpeter time. It's related to all the constants and functions that go into the Eddington luminosity. And it's about 5 times 10 to the 7. years. Okay? So they can grow fairly quickly by cosmological standards. But that is actually not quick enough. And the reason that there is a conundrum is because we can discover, we have discovered quasars at large enough distances that uh, we are really observing them at a time when the universe was very young. And by that time, they managed to grow black holes with masses of about 2 times 10 to the 9 solar masses. Okay. So, for example, at a redshift of 7, which is the record for the most distant quasars that we know of today, the age of the universe was uh, 780 million years. Um, if galaxy formation started at around a redshift of 20, the growth time of the black hole would have been 600 million years. Okay. According to Eddington limited accretion, the growth factor would be 6.2 times 10 to the 5 in that amount of time. So the seed mass out of which it all started would have to be about 10 to the 3 solar masses. Okay, So therein lies the problem. The first black holes have to start at 1,000 solar masses, and we don't know how, to, how those are made in order for them to grow at the maximum rate and reach a mass of 2 times 10 to the 9 solar masses at the redshift 7. Okay? This is the conundrum. If we find quasars that go back uh, longer at redshifts 8 and 9, so the seed masses implied by those discoveries would be progressively an order of magnitude bigger, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5. Okay? So this, le this leads us to one of the topics of the conference, which is contemplating formation mechanisms for seeds. Okay. There are ways to get around the growth problem, but they're speculative because we're not sure how exactly they might work. The growth time depends on this efficiency factor. We can reduce this number. Sorry, we can, yes, we can reduce this number and reduce the saltpeter time. Okay, and then the growth can be accomplished faster. But we can't reduce it too much. This is already near the lower limit for a non rotating black hole. Things will get worse as the black hole growth grows. It accretes material with large specific angular momentum, and it starts to spin up. Its efficiency of radiation gets higher, and the growth slows down. We can also consider um, mergers between black holes. Their host galaxies merge. The black holes sink to the center. They find each other. They spiral in, and they merge. At best, that would double the mass. Okay. So after several doublings, we can get from seeds that are 100 solar masses to seeds that are 1,000 solar masses or more. And that might solve the growth problem. Okay. 
So let's get into the question of the seeds. Okay, seed formation. There are three scenarios um, that we're contemplating today. The first scenario has seeds as the remnants of the first generation of stars. These stars are extremely massive compared to present day stars. The reason is that uh, the abundance of heavy elements was tiny at redshift 20. <coughs> Therefore, the cooling mechanisms for the gas are not, uh, that are, sorry, the cooling mechanisms for hydrogen are limited. Hydrogen doesn't cool efficiently, so it cannot contract very effectively to form stars, okay? So the first generation of stars have masses, about 100 solar masses, a few hundred solar masses. When they uh, end their lives, they can explode as supernovae and leave behind fine black holes with masses between 50 and 100 solar masses. There are even scenarios in which the most massive of the first generation of stars uh, collapse directly into black holes. At any rate, we get a few hundred solar mass seeds at best. And this scenario seems to be in contradiction with uh, the observations. The other um, scenario would be collapse of what we call locally unstable cloud. So we start with a large lump of gas that begins to contract. Okay. As it contracts, it fragments. Every fragment makes a star. So the large, so the large cloud itself becomes a star cluster after one <coughs> dynamical time. The density of stars is extremely high. They suffer collisions. They merge with each other, and they settle down to form a large black hole. Okay. So this this would give us 10 to the 3 solar mass seed. Uh, okay. This would give us 10 to the 2 solar mass seed. <coughs> And then the third scenario is a collapse of, the, of a globally unstable cloud. Okay. So the cloud just comes down, forms a um, supermassive star at the center, which then collapses into a black hole. And that black hole accretes the rest of the cloud coming in. And that gives us 10 to the 6 solar mass. Cool the cloud enough to collapse. Sorry. Cool the cloud enough. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I'm I'm not sure how it's done. I'm not familiar with the with the models that make this prediction. Um, obviously, you have to cool it in order to accomplish the collapse. Uh, from what we know about uh, masses of black holes in distant quasars, this scenario seems unlikely. These two scenarios could work. Okay. But we have a difficulty in testing these scenarios because after the <coughs> seeds grow to some substantial mass, they lose memory of their origin. All we observe is their present day mass and we don't know where they got it. Therefore, with what we observe today, it's very hard to test these ideas. One possible way of making progress is looking at really small galaxies that have not merged many times. Therefore, their black holes have not accreted a lot. So those might be pristine black holes and they might give us information about how they started. Okay. Some talk of primordial black holes. Primordial black holes, meaning uh, they started at a much higher redshift. Yes, and I'm not. Uh, I couldn't give you a good answer uh, about that. Um, are they? Do they have the right conditions to satisfy to get around the growth problem? That's the first question I would ask. But beyond that, I don't know. Maybe if a member of the audience knows, we can. Talk about this in the discussion session. Okay. Okay. And then finally, um, feedback is the other topic. I'll go over this kind of quickly and paint a heuristic picture of feedback. And that assumes very simple, uh, makes very simple assumptions about how feedback works. 
So you start with a galaxy that's a ball of gas, uh, sorry, a ball of dark matter that's described uh, as an isothermal sphere. You put gas in it and you, allow, you form a black hole in the center and you allow the gas to rain down onto that black hole. Okay. So the accretion rate exceeds the Eddington limit. So the excess gas is expelled. And the mechanism by which it is expelled may be a radiation pressure driven outflow from the accretion disk, from the inner parts of the accretion disk. That's why I kept this picture here. Okay. Now, the outgoing gas will provide a thrust. This is the Eddington thrust. Okay. And that's what's pushing the gas out. Now, the effect on the host galaxy will be dramatic. And the reason is because if you say that, if you allow for accretion um, at the Eddington limit, in a saltpeter time, that implies that the energy of the outflow can exceed the binding energy of the gas in the host galaxy. So if you have an effective way of coupling the outflow to the gas, you can evacuate the galaxy. And the process proceeds in stages. First, um, the gas pushes, sorry, first the outflow pushes the gas in the galaxy out, compresses it into a shell. The cooling mechanisms available to the outflowing gas determine largely which agents are responsible for, the, for evacuating the gas. Compton cooling is thought to be effective at small radii. That means that the gas remains cool. <coughs> thermal pressure is not as important as the momentum of the outflow. As the bubble expands, Compton cooling becomes less effective and thermal pressure starts to become more important. In the end, the compression of the shell leads to star formation. That's an additional source of feedback because supernovae explode out of the newly formed stars and they contribute to pushing the gas out. Finally, the gas is evacuated and star formation stops. So the growth of the stellar population of the galaxy stops. And at that time, the growth, of course, of the black hole stops. Okay. And this kind of regulating process is contributing to establishing the M-sigma relation. If you chase uh, through the equations and see how the mass of the black hole, or actually the accreted mass, which really sets the final mass, depends on the parameters of the problem, it depends largely on the potential of the host galaxy, and therefore, the final mass of the black hole ends up being of order sigma to the fourth, which explains the M sigma relation. Okay. So that is the story in a nutshell. Okay. And let's go back now to the, as I'm running out of time, let's go back to the goals of the, problem, of the conference <coughs> of our program and consider what we are doing here. On the subject of um, the growth of supermassive black holes, the specific questions we're considering are the origin of seeds. That's a very sketchy outline of the scenarios. Some of those scenarios are better worked out than others. The formation of the first generation of stars has been the subject of a lot of work in the past decade. But the collapse of clouds down to uh, forming seeds is not as well uh, examined as this. So that's one of the things that we should be considering or will be considering. We want to understand the fueling problem, the solutions to the fueling problem, and accretion flows. So we're essentially thinking about how we're going to connect simulations that describe the gas on large scales, with large scales within the galaxy, which are typically Newtonian, to simulations on much smaller scales, which um, sometimes are relativistic, they often include magnetic fields, and they have to include radiation processes for the cooling of the gas. So those are the 
general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulations. We have to understand the role of feedback. And what we're trying to do along those lines is I, um, identify the different mechanisms of feedback. I've already mentioned two, the wind or an outflow from the active nucleus, feedback from stars, it's suspected that feedback from star formation is important in small galaxies where the potentials are not very deep. Therefore, some kinetic energy injection from supernovae can evacuate the gas and stop star formation. For much more massive galaxies, a lot more energy is needed, so feedback from the active nucleus might be necessary. Okay? And we would like to compare models with observations. There's a, a lot of observational data, and we have to connect them to models and extract constraints. And then the topic that I have not talked about, black hole mergers. If you want to ask me, I can tell you quickly where we're going with that. But otherwise, I will stop here. Thanks very much. Explain the concept of a globally unstable cloud and a hard time visualizing the collapse mechanism. Okay, so I'll do my best, but I'm not sure if I can give you a good answer. Uh, and if somebody can help me here, uh, chime in. Um, we can start with the genes mass. Okay, so the genes mass um, is the limit at which uh, the gravitational contraction of a cloud cannot be supported by internal gas pressure. So you can uh, approach um, that question in a couple of ways. One way uh, that is easier to explain, you begin with a ball of gas, you, let it you perturb it a little bit, you let it contract. For gas pressure to respond, sound waves have to carry the information all the way across the cloud. So you want the dynamical time of the cloud set by its mass and radius to be um, longer than the sound crossing time of the cloud. Okay. And from there, you can derive the condition on the size and therefore the condition on the mass of the cloud for instability. And let me write down an equation for that. Okay. The gene's length <coughs> is about 30 parsecs t k to the one half density over one minus one half. And the resulting mass from this, 2,200 solar masses, so this gives you a scale of mass lumps that can begin to contract, and the contraction will not uh, be opposed effectively by gas pressure. Okay. So that's one way of thinking of this instability. So a globally unstable cloud uh, will be uh, above the genes mass. Okay. And as we go back in time, the density of the intergalactic medium changes. The temperature changes. So these are our two free parameters, tunable parameters that we can uh, adjust to set uh, the genes mass. Okay. Now, what I cannot give you a, a good answer to is when can a cloud be globally stable and locally unstable? That's a distinction I'm not sure I can make. Does anybody know? Can you radiate out the energy by yes. metals, enough metals of Yes, energy? you have to. So you have to radiate out for the. Con this is the beginning of the contraction. After, for the contraction to, com, uh, to proceed, the gas has to cool. So you need effective radiation mechanisms. If you only have hydrogen, then their mechanisms are restricted. As you put in heavier elements, you open the door to many more mechanisms. Um, at that redshift, there's not a lot of heavy elements. So you are relying on hydrogen and largely hydrogen molecular, uh, sorry, molecular hydrogen emission processes. What is the, the galaxy uh, merger rate? Um, 
Yes. Do you know? Does anybody know? Well, observationally? Yeah, observationally. So for a massive galaxy, two times the Milky Way, it's about one per five giga years. One to one for five to ten giga years. That's equal mass mergers. For smaller mass mergers, it's not observationally all the term. It's also right. relatively redshift. Uh, it's redshift less than one. Yeah. Retro squared and one, it's, we think, but measuring it's hard. Well, there's some of this. Things, things get complicated when there's more than one galaxy in the same dark matter halo. Yeah. They might not merge. Yeah. So we're not merging. There haven't been many mergers, it sounds like. Well, in, so this number refers to the very local universe. So the hope is that at large redshifts, the merger rate would have been higher. How do you know that there are black holes in those numbers? Oh, we don't know that either. That's one of the hot topics of debate. It's called so the number is the occupation fraction. You start you start in your simulations with dark matter halos, and then um, those are the will evolve into proto-galaxies, and then you ask the question, what fraction of those have a black hole? Well, can form a seed at the center? And that's an open question. You know that the redshift seven quasar with the billions on that black hole, those are extremely rare. 